Hey friends, welcome back to another video. I have been wanting to get this one up for a while. I had a really good response to my philodendron Mikan's care and I thought that it was time to do one for the Tordum. Truth be told, I don't do these kinds of videos on my channel because I said this in my Mikan's video, I just don't want people to come here thinking that I think I'm an expert or I think that I know it all about like how to grow plants and this is the right way to grow plants. I uh, truly believe in trial by error, learning by yourself, um, learning from failures, learning from successes. That is my method, no matter what expert, actual experts say out there. But I feel like for the plants that I feel really comfortable with, that have been growing with me for at least a few years, and when I mean a few years, I mean like at least three, four years, and they've been growing well, and I've had a lot of success with them um, using whatever method that works for me, I just feel like I'd wanna share that with you. So the Mykins is one that I feel very, very comfortable with. The Mykins is like my comfort plant, and I wanna say that this is a close second, my tortum. I like to call it the tortellini, and I have had this plant for, uh, gosh, let me just quickly, I'm just jumping right into it, but um, this is what my tortum looked like back in 2021. I think that I actually acquired this in 2020, um, but it was just a little stick and it didn't have a leaf yet and it was kind of dormant for a long time. And I will talk more about that later because I'm answering a bunch of your questions today. So. It's taken a few years to get from this size to what it is now, which is this glorious, glorious angel. And we're actually going to be repotting it today while I answer some questions. But before that, just very quickly, my merch is out today. I've had these styles tucked away for like a year now and I just couldn't really wrap my mind around actually sitting down and finalizing them but with the end of the year coming and my goal was to actually get these up by summer and that never happened but I figure if I can get it up before Christmas that's better than nothing but yeah there's a few new styles let me pop in a little screen recording here I think I have maybe seven or eight new styles there's a new skew the oversized shirt it goes up to a 3xl which is more like a 4 to 5xl I'm wearing a large right now and I am swimming well no this is a medium so this is what I want it to look like my normal size is a small so I just went one size up honestly if I got a small I probably would still like the way that fits too and I wouldn't have to roll it up so my suggestion for the oversized fit is to get the size that you normally wear and it'll fit oversized but if you want it extra oversized then go one size up I would not recommend going two sizes up because then the sleeves get really long and it gets really long down here um, but it has a good fit width wise I feel it drapes really nicely over the shoulder which was one big thing for me um, if you have any of my shirts from my previous run and you own the super soft tee it has more of a fitted look it is it's not tight but it's definitely a lot uh, for more form fitting than this one so if you want to go oversized on that skew I would go two sizes up minimum I do have baby stuff as well baby and kid stuff I wanted to get more kid styles up but I just with the time constraints and me needing to film and like leaving for california soon this was all that i could manage to get up but i'm actually really proud of both styles and i hope that you guys love it too i actually hope that you guys just love the full run um it was really fun to design it has consumed me for the last two weeks but yeah i hope you love it thank you to everyone who has purchased my merch previously uh you guys honestly blew me out of the water with that run and i just like cannot thank you enough so i hope you guys have the same reaction to it this time around um and yeah i appreciate you guys so anyway with that said let's jump right into today's video i am going to just kind of sit down and uh go through a few questions first and then for some of the questions that i don't need to like concentrate so much on um we will just get straight to repotting this because she's way overdue i think it's been in this vessel for 
maybe a year and like five months or four months or something and it's just completely outgrown it and so it just needs bigger pants okay so the first question is how long have i had it obviously i just touched on this a little bit but i acquired it at the end of 2020 i think if i can remember it was in september of 2020 that i got it as it wasn't like a wet stick it i mean basically it was it had the stick and like the profile if you guys don't know what a profile is it's like that first leaf that comes out and it's never like a, like a full leaf it's like the teeny tiniest little sliver of a thing um, and so it really was more of a wet stick with an activated sprout or activated bud, whatever. And yeah, it was probably like this little and it didn't really start showing me like it's tortum leaves until maybe January. So it took a little while for it to get started, but I've had it now for how long is that? For the end of the year, 21, two, three, like four years now. I can't believe I just had to do that math in my head. Um, <laughs> so embarrassing. But yeah, it's been a couple years since I've had it and it's been honestly one of the funnest plants to grow. It doesn't obviously change form too much from like its juvenile, you know, stage. Like pretty much just kind of looks like this, but I don't know why it's just so exciting to me and it's always been one of my favorite plants. So yeah, that was such a good buy. I don't remember who I got it from. I can't remember if it was like someone in our Facebook group or on Marketplace or I don't remember. I don't remember who I got this from, but I'm just so glad that I did. And I feel like I got such a great specimen. Um, I don't think that all tortum are created equal, just like any other plant. I see some tortum that don't have as like I don't know, beautiful as leaves as, as these. I feel like there's some tortum that even when they're really young, they just kind of run and run and run. But this one has just grown so well, so compact. Um, it just has had such a nice growth pattern, but it is changing now as it grows. And I will show you and talk about that a little bit more later. Um, the next question that people had was how often do I water and if they like to stay wet or have dry periods? My tortum has pretty much since like it's been like one year old has always lived in no drainage and I water it at least once a week no matter if the substrate is still wet or dry but I will say that there have been times where it's gone like longer dry periods mostly because when it started to have like a much larger wingspan and I've had to elevate it and get it away from other plants. I kind of have forgotten to water it um, some weeks and it's gone like drier periods, like two, two and a half weeks without getting water. And honestly, I have never once seen this plant thirsty. It doesn't droop, it doesn't shrivel, it doesn't do anything. It just kind of stays the way it is. I don't know if this is true for all tortum, but I will say it can grow well with weekly waterings and kind of always making sure it has a little bit of moisture in the in the pot or the vessel, but it is forgiving if you do forget to water. And I feel like the, the way the roots form, the way the roots feel, they're a little bit more wiry than like your regular philodendron and they're a little stiffer and tougher. And I feel with that, it makes it a little bit more tolerant to something like dry rot or even wet rot. I know people are going to disagree with me here because I've had so many people ask like, why can't I get it to stop rotting? Why does it always like die on me? It keeps mushing. I wish I had the answer for you, but I just find, I've always found this to be one of my easier plants to care for. And I don't know if it's the no drainage thing. Um, I will say that I have dry rotted more philodendron in pots with drainage than I have with no drainage. Um, so to answer, anyway, to answer this question, do they like to stay, how often to water? Once a week. I don't really ever let water kind of just like sit at the bottom. I like to evenly water it and just leave it at that. In terms of staying wet, I don't prefer it to be, again, sitting in water and I would much rather it be more on the dry side. So that's just me. And also we have to um, factor in lighting, right? So whenever you're thinking about watering, I always say that 
you can't give someone an answer about watering of a certain plant or any plant unless you know what lighting situation we're talking about is it getting natural light which direction is that window um, how many hours of direct light is it getting how many hours of indirect light is it getting is it in a greenhouse is it in a controlled environment like there's so many factors but i guess just to simplify things with my tortum for the first maybe two years, it lived in controlled, in a controlled environment, meaning an environment like this where I'm not getting any natural light. It is just getting light from my grow lights and I can basically control everything around it. Um, the warmth, the humidity, the light. And I've found that it actually prefers more warmth than anything. I feel like I had the most robust um, and fastest growth when I had it somewhere warm like an exo or my tent or something when I had a tent I've noticed that the growth has slowed down pretty significantly since removing it from um, a controlled environment because now it's living in my living room but in terms of the lighting compared to here and there it's drastically different in my living room, it's not getting any lights from a grow light. It is solely relying on the light that's in my living room, which to be honest, is not a ton. Yes, I have huge windows. Yes, I do get direct light on my plants in there for a certain period of the day, but it's not so much that I could rely on it completely, which is why I do have grow lights out there. But for this one, I never had it under a grow light um, and it's always done pretty okay. You just wanna like follow that rule of thumb that if you're gonna be removing light from your plant, you also want to take down the water levels a bit too because light, whether from a grow light or the, the sun, it's going to like, the plant's gonna use that water more, it's gonna evaporate faster. In general, your substrates are just gonna dry out a lot faster when it's exposed to more light. So when you pull it away from that light, you wanna just like take it down a little bit so that that balance of light to water is more equal. What that is gonna look like specifically in terms of like a specific like two cups or three cups of water, that's really gonna be something that you have to figure out on your own, unfortunately. Um, I can't give you a definitive like, oh yeah, give it one cup of water a week and you're gonna be fine, you'll never rot it. One thing that you'll find with plants, if you're new to plants, is that you're gonna learn best by making mistakes and by trial by error, like I said earlier. So yeah, anyway, the lighting situation before when I was still growing it from a small plant, I was always using either Barina bars or Monios. Monios are gonna be lighter they're or brighter. They're 24 watts versus these, which are 10 watts. And I have never bleached the plant before. It's been really, really close to a grow light. So I do think that they're more tolerant to direct light. It had the fastest growth in my tent when it was really, really warm and really bright, but it outgrew that tent really fast. But honestly, I have found that the acclimatization from a high humidity, high light environment to a lower light, low humidity environment was not that difficult. I think that when I transitioned this tortum out from my grow room to the living room, I probably lost maybe one or two leaves, but that was about it. And then the only other change that I noticed was the growth was slowed down um, by, a, by a lot. But with a plant that has this big of a wingspan, that's pushing out leaves this big, I will take slow growth. I am not in any rush to have this grow any faster than it is. Um, someone asked what my substrate preference is and if I prefer a big pot or a small pot. I have always grown my tortum in soil. From what I can remember, I have never had it in pond. I've never had it in LECA. It's always been in soil and I was even using tree fern fiberless soil, um, just the regular peat-based soil, a little bit of uh, coarse perlite, some char like uh, horticultural charcoal or some biochar, fir bark. At some point, I did have a little bit of chopped up sphagnum moss in there just to kind of get root started um, when I transferred it from its like propagation, propagation substrate to its more permanent um, vessel. Sorry, I can't think right now. 
and yeah it's never not liked soil and so i never felt the need to transition it to something like pond i do like growing some philodendron in pond but because it's done so well in soil that is going to be my recommendation i do have it in a i would say a fairly small pot for the size of the plant so it doesn't seem like it cares too much about being root bound it has sized up regardless of what pot size it's been in and i just i just think that this is one of those philodendron that prefer to be left alone i think one of the biggest mistakes that i made as a plant parent in the beginning was that anytime i saw roots kind of like hitting the sides of the pot or whatever, I was like, oh my gosh, it's time for a repot, like it needs something bigger. Yes, I do believe in like the big pants, big plants method. You know, if you size up your pot, it's gonna size up the plant a lot faster. But I also think that there are plants out there, if not maybe all plants, they just prefer to be left alone. I think that we tend to finick with them a lot more than they would like. We pick and prod at it, at it and um, sometimes they just thrive on neglect. If you guys notice, like if you go on, uh, if you go on vacation and you know, you haven't been touching your plants and you haven't been moving things around and you come back and like some of the leaves are like the biggest they've ever been and all these plants are growing. And I don't know if they do that on purpose to like surprise us when we get back, but I just feel like some plants just want to be left the heck alone. And for me, this is one of them. I've known that this has needed a repot for a long time. It probably because it could have used a bigger pot like six months ago, but it's been growing fine. So if it's growing fine, this fungus mats piss me off. <laughs> if it's growing fine, I leave it alone unless I see the roots are starting to like come up, which I think the, this actually is. Oh no, I think that was another philodendron of mine you'll notice sometimes that roots start to grow up out of the soil and that is like one sure way to know that a plant is looking for bigger pants i don't really i guess i don't really have a preference of like big or small in my experience it's always been the size of the root system or a little bit smaller let's talk fertilization so i when i was growing back in 2020 i was using Oh my gosh, liquid gold leaf. I loved liquid gold leaf. And then they just stopped shipping out of the UK. And so I couldn't have access to that anymore. But in the first, I wanna say like year and a half or two years of its life, it was getting liquid gold leaf and CalMag. But now it's been getting strictly TPS1 and TPS CalMag. So I'm gonna show you the one that I have. This is a fertilizer that I have been using religiously for two years now. I have not been experimenting with any other fertil fertilizers because I just wanted to, I wanted to have like a good run of growing plants with the same fertilizer, not changing anything because I feel like with everything out there, it's kind of natural for us to want to like explore and experiment with new things, especially if like your favorite influencer or creator or whatever um is like they swear by a certain product and then you get really curious and you want to try it too but i'm just trying to stick with what is working i'm happy with the performance of tps1 um, i don't feel like i've ever over fertilized with tps1 and i have so many of my plants in no drainage so i'm very very happy with that and then the calmag that i'm using i was using this Oh gosh, I can't remember what brand. Is it like Sensi Cow or something like that? That was a brand I was using for a couple years. And I switched to CalMag Complete. And I also use CalMag with nitros. I don't have the bottle anymore because I moved it into like another bottle. But those are the two CalMags that I'm using from, T from TPS. And I really like it as well. I feel like my plants over the last year have seen the most growth that they have um, since I've been caring for plants, honestly. I think just, you know, giving them a good routine has helped and fertilizing, fertilizing, I'm gonna throw it up on the screen, fertilizing weekly, weekly. Um, that's my rule of thumb. So that is my fertilizer method. I do about a quarter strength of the CalMag every week or every other week. And then I do maybe half strength of the TPS1 every other week. So 
My tortum is getting fertilizer every single week and I try to re-inoculate with either great white or TPS billions at least once every two weeks. I have been pretty good about maintaining that and sort of um, keeping up with the mycorrhizal inoculants in my vessels. I'm not super worried about the ones in no drainage like this one. I, since it's so high up, I don't really feel the need to like re-inoculate it every two weeks or every three weeks, but I definitely have been doing that with my Ethereum um, because they have drainage holes. So yeah, uh, TPS1, TPS CalMag, either Great White or TPS Billions for mycorrhizal inoculant, and that is pretty much all this plant is getting. I am about ready to get this repotted and answer some of the other questions. So I'm gonna get set up here and then we will get right into the repot. Okay, actually, before I get this unpotted, I wanna give you a closer look because one of the questions that I got was, do I put it on a pole? and is mine climbing or crawling? Let me show you what it looks like right now. It is a crazy, crazy situation. Oh, my Lanta. Oh, please don't screw this up, Shermie. She's a big girl, y'all. And I just ripped off a leaf. Well, I ripped off part of a leaf. Not the end of the world. I don't even know where that came from. Who done it? Who is it? Who is it? Where did it even? I don't even know where the missing leaves are. Is it this one? No. What the heck? Okay, anyway, <laughs> can't find it. Um, so here is how big it is right now. Body for scale. She's large and in charge. So I did, in good faith, try and get it on a pole. You can see said pole, but you can also see she is resisting arrest. She is resisting it so hard. Without this Velcro tie here, it just falls forward. She doesn't want a pole. She's never wanted a pole. Um, I will say though that as it's matured, the internodes have gotten quite long. It used to be like stacked right on top of each other, but you can see right here, We've got some longer internodes, but it's interesting because I've got this long guy right here. It didn't change any lighting situation at all. Um, and then it started to tighten up again up here. So I'm not really sure what's up with that, but with all of that said, I don't think that I'm going to continue forcing a pull on this thing. I think I just want to give it something to hold on to. So I'm gonna opt to do two of these clear stakes in the pot. And then I'm just gonna like use um, Velcro ties to kind of support the stem on it. I just don't see this plant utilizing a pole the way it's supposed to utilize it. And it's more of an eyesore if anything. It's just growing really crazy right now. Like you can see it's, it was crawling for a little bit. I don't know if it's gonna be hard to tell, but that stem is crawling. Oh my gosh, you can't see anything. Maybe it'll be better once I unpot it. But for the longest time, it was crawling um, and then it started to go back up. So I may have to chop off some leaves just to kind of get it tamed. I wanna get more of this stem under the substrate and I do think it can afford to lose some leaves. I do love how bushy this thing is though, so we will have to see <laughs> how brave I am once I start unpotting. But to answer the question, it does not need a pole to size up. That I know because it's not using the pole. Someone asked if I can just use a bamboo stake. I do not see why not. I think as long as it feels like it's supported in some way, you're gonna see some size growth. That is my take on the moss pole tortum situation. Um, now let's get this unpotted. So I don't even know where to start. I'm not even, I don't, I don't know. By the way, you guys, this, uh, I was gonna say this movie, this video is bookmarked so you can kind of jump to what you need in the video because I'm gonna be blabbing as usual. All right, best angle, angolini to show you this repot. Okay, I feel like it's just gonna fall forward. 
And I just have to, there are leaves everywhere. This thing is breaking left and right. Okay, I'm gonna take off this first strap. There's like four Velcro ties on this thing. Two, three, four, yep, there's four. Someone asked um, why their tortum is not sizing up. It's hard, it's really hard to tell without knowing your conditions. I am not gonna say it's because you don't have a pole because my tortum has continued to size up without a pole. I've really just been forcing this pole onto it and it's not even using it. I don't wanna say it's a light thing because my tortum is not even getting a bunch of light. Although I will say that the, the new leaf sizes they're not like astronomically larger, right? Like they're they're a good size, they're big, but I feel like it probably could be bigger than it is now if I was giving it more of a artificial light situation or at least moving it closer to a window or something. Oh, I think it actually might be rooted a little bit into this pole. So I'm just gonna remove it. I think one constant that I have given this plant is fertilizer. So uh, yeah, like I said, I'm using TPS1 and CalMag. So if you wanna just try fertilizing weekly, weekly, I would recommend that. And also I am just a huge, like you guys know me, but the no drainage has worked so well for me with this plant. I do think with my watering habits and with how high up it's been on a shelf, I can almost guarantee that this plant would probably be more of in a rehab situation or have died um, or would have died at some point or at least rotted or something if it was in a pot with drainage holes just because the plant utilizes quite a bit of water oh my gosh it utilizes quite a bit of water and it's not Oh, I'm so scared. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to break anything, but I don't think that's going to be possible. Guys. All right. I'm going to loosen her up a little bit. I'm not going to say it. I will refrain, but I think my only suggestion would be to maybe try and copy the conditions I'm giving it, which is, yeah, weekly fertilization, no drainage if you're brave enough. It's really not that hard, you guys. And that's it. And maybe a, yeah, some kind of stick to support it. If you can get it on a pole, obviously I'm not gonna like deter you from using a pole. I'm gonna not tell you to not use a pole because, you know, it is a climber. Oh my word, I heard a snap. I heard a snap, I heard a snap. She has the weirdest growth pattern and I'm gonna be so sticky. Also, I wanna quickly touch on pests. I don't feel like this plant has been very, very prone to pests the way my other philodendron are. The only pest I have ever had on this plant before was spider mites. It's never had thrips, it's never had mealies, it's never had any of that. It's always been spider mites. But I'll say that even when it did have spider mites, the damage wasn't very noticeable. The plant didn't seem very stressed. Now, I don't know if that's because I'm using mycorrhizal inoculant. I do, I do think it just makes your plants more resilient to things like that in general. But if you do find that your um, tortum has spider mites or some kind of pest, just give it a nice little wash down. I haven't had any trouble with like burning of these leaves with pesticides, but of course, if it's gonna be under a grow light, just turn off the grow light once you put it back there, if it's not fully dry. And because this plant produces so much extra floral nectaries anyway, I would recommend giving it a shower as often as you can. I try and give this one a bath not a bath. I try and give it a shower in my bathroom at least twice a month. I'm doing it mainly because I don't want it to get pests. But yeah, it does really, I feel like it does 
appreciate the um, the shower because you can see here I had oh I messed up these leaves oh my gosh this one looks terrible I just I just messed that up I think I like must have run it over or something um, there's a leaf here oh here there's a leaf right here that's a perfect example of what can happen in low humidity if you look at the tip of that it's like it had some trouble unfurling and if you look at the way that the new leaves look it's like all wrapped around itself it's really really crazy and you'll find that in low humidity sometimes the tip of it has a hard time fully unfurling and then it'll harden off when it's still closed so I've had some tips break off, but that's really the only issue I've had with it in low, lower humidity. But spraying it helps a lot. It kind of just like makes things a little bit slipperier and it's like that lubrication that it needs to unfurl properly. So yeah, giving it a shower really helps, especially when there's an emergent leaf. So if you can afford to um, bring your tortum to the shower, every so often it will definitely appreciate it for multiple reasons in terms of pesticides that i've used on this plant i've used everything from safer's insecticidal soap to the safer's miticide i've used captain jacks i've used the uh what's that spider mite spray i have this like one specific oh dr doom spider mite knockout i've also used there's another one that i used for spider mites I've used Spino on this. Oh, I just said that. Spino, I've used Azimax. I've pretty much used everything and it hasn't reacted badly to it at all. So yeah, again, just make sure not to like put it right back under light if it's still wet because it will damage your leaves. My arm is so tired. So this thing is like kind of rooted into the pole. I can't, I can't put it down. That's the thing, but I wanna, I really wanna get this sort of undone how do i do this i need to be i need to put it down okay again i might have some casualties but it's for the greater good of the plant i think it'll appreciate having much bigger pants because this pot is just way too small i don't even know i don't know why i cleaned my floors before i did this I'm making a giant mess. This pole was like, what did you expect me to do? <laughs> it's so tiny compared to the plant. Okay, so I've got one nice root that's gone into the pole, but now I have to find the end of it to fish it out of here. Another question that was asked is how often does it push out leaves? When it was in a controlled environment, when it was in my plant room, I want to say that I was getting at least two leaves a month. And now with it in the living room, I'm gonna say it's about one leaf per month or maybe one leaf every other month or something. It's a lot slower, but again, not, um, not really worried about that because of space constraints. Also, I've never chopped this plant. I have had this um, stem the way it is since I've gotten it, I believe. I'm trying to see how long it is. I think it goes all the way down here. Yeah, and the smallest leaf on this thing is, oh, it's so tiny. I, I really might cut off some of these lower leaves just so that I can, I wanna submerge this a little bit more. Oh, now that it's unpotted, let me show you what this stem looks like. So again, the stem probably goes all the way down like here and it was climbing for a bit. And then look at where that bend is. Hopefully you can see it. It's like bends at like a 90 degree angle right there. And then it starts climbing again. Oh, you can kind of see it a little better. It's like a little squiggle. So I'd love to get like this entire thing under the substrate if possible. So, I don't really want to chop it because I really would love to keep as much of the root system as possible, but that means I'm probably going to have to remove all of these lower leaves. And I know it's painful because 
they're so cute. And I just, I, I do think that having it super bushy really, you know, brings that look together to make it such a statement piece. But um, I have so many aerial roots up here that I wanna get under the substrate and it's just gonna be better for the plant long-term. So if you do not like pruning of plants, please uh, look away. I will throw in a timestamp where you can fast forward to when it's safe again. Let me uh, just answer another question while I'm doing this. Someone asked if I've ever had it grow a runner and I honestly didn't even know that this plant was capable of runners, but I have never ever had a runner on this plant before. I know Daryl over at House Plant Journal, he posted his tortum recently and was talking about the runner that he had on his tortum. And when I first looked at that photo, like in the very, very beginning, I didn't even know it was a tortum. But yeah, I've never had that issue before. Uh, luckily, nothing, nothing irritates me more than a runner. That's why I could not have the Monstera spruciana anymore. It was just, I love the way the spruciana leaves look, but runners are just, oh, they bother me so much. Ooh, that was actually painful. I have a attachment to this plant that I do not have any other plant in my collection. And it's so easy for me to chop and whatever, any other plant, but this one, as you can tell, cause I've never chopped it before. It's just, it's precious to me. So I feel like that's all I feel comfortable chopping. Actually, maybe let's do this one down here. I'll show you some of these smaller leaves. Ugh. Oh, the smell, the fragrance, it's beautiful. Okay, so it's freed up this much stem because I want to get this whole guy in there and I'm not going to chop it because I'd still love to see some size growth on it. Okay, um, now I need the new pot. Where are you, pot? Okay, let's look at some of these smaller leaves. Oh my gosh, some there's a light crackling back here. I'm not trying to have a fire. Okay, I chopped off one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. This is the smallest leaf on it. This leaf is probably like three years old. Seriously, this plant for me does not shed a lot. It like, I feel like with philodendron, it's usually like the one in one out, at least maybe every other leaf, you're gonna lose one of the lower leaves. But this tortum, I have always had to prune it. I've always had to remove the leaves to like repot it deeper because it just does not like to let go, which is why it's so bushy. I don't know if that's everyone's experience, but that is my experience with the tortum and I kind of love it. So here is the pot size jump that I'm doing. I'm going from this size to this size. So it's a pretty significant size jump. I would have loved to have some Leca down at the bottom and I could if I take the time to literally pick some out here, but I don't even know if it's enough to make it worth my time. That kind of sucks, but it didn't have a Leca layer down at the bottom on the other one, but this pot is so much bigger. Is that a corm? Um, yeah, I'm not gonna bother. There's like not enough. So anyway, let's just get this repotted. I'm gonna answer this one. I think I've covered pretty much everything. Watering, lighting, pests, potting. The mix that I'm using today is pretty much what I mentioned earlier. It's a peat-based soil. The one I'm using right now is the uh, Promix, HP Promix Mycorrhizae soil. And um, I just add fur bark, I add uh, worm castings, horticultural charcoal, uh, coarse perlite. I don't think there's any orchiata in here, tree fern fiber, and that is it. And I wanna say that it's like, I mean, it's chunky, but it's not like super, super chunky. Some people are like, oh, that's way too dense. But honestly, the amount of plants that I've lost from dry rot from a from soil that was way too um, way too chunky. I will never do that again. Sorry. So the last question was more so like 
struggles related. It seems like a good amount of people really, really struggle with keeping the Tornum happy. And I don't, I don't really know why. I'm not, I'm not joking. I'm sorry if that's not helpful, but I really don't know why because this has actually been one of my easier philodendron. I feel like it's required not much of my like energy, <laughs> my time. It's, it's just been a very, very low key, low maintenance kind of philodendron for me, which is another reason I appreciate it so much. But I don't know if it's because I'm doing the no drainage thing. I really feel like with no drainage, yes, you're gonna have like salt mi salt and mineral buildup and stuff but i also kind of think that you know it, it it's able to retain more of like that good bacteria the good fun fungi it kind of has like its own little ecosystem in there and i feel like if you have tried everything or you feel like you've tried everything and no drainage has been something that you were scared to do I would maybe recommend it because it's like if you're struggling with the tortum so much at this point it's like what do you really have to lose you know it's worth giving it a shot i'm not saying that you can't grow tortum in pots with drainage but i'm just saying that's been the no drainage method has been um really really effective for me and i don't really see myself growing this plant with drainage holes I think if I ever need a pot bigger than this, I'm probably just gonna chop it and get it into a smaller pot again. But I think some things that I really wanna drive home, like if I had to summarize the care of Tordum in general, it's one, I keep saying this, water, or not water, fertilize weekly, every single week. I'm not saying that you have to go and buy the fertilizer that I'm using but if you can give it some kind of fertilizer in a diluted amount every single week, um, that's gonna really help like maintain those leaves and get nice healthy growth going. Especially a plant like the Tordum where I was talking about how it has, it's such a complex unfurling process for the Tordum. And especially if you're doing it in low humidity, you wanna make sure that like you've got a nice healthy root system and that your root system is uptaking all of those micro and macronutrients because it's gonna help a lot with the unfurling process in creating like strong cell walls and stuff like that. So if you, you know, if you have a plant that is weak, it's gonna give you growth that reflects that. I wanna say that warmth is more important than, than anything especially if you're just getting started or if you're struggling with it, try putting it in a um, place that is getting more warmth than maybe somewhere like your living room. If you've got a tent, that would be awesome. I would try doing tent life or any kind of greenhouse. Obviously, once it gets to this size, you won't be able to keep it in a greenhouse anymore, but at least to get it going, right? And to um, give it the best sort of start in life. And I also would not, and this goes for any plant, I would not recommend moving any of these aeroids into ambient until it has a really strong root system and robust root system. I've never done like, I don't think I've, I think I have done an acclimatization video. I think one misconception with acclimatizing these kinds of plants down to ambient conditions, sorry, I'm trying to figure out where I'm putting this stick and like how I'm gonna tie it up. Anyway, sorry if you can't see me, but yeah, I think a huge misconception with acclimatizing these plants down to ambient, I just spilled everywhere, is that you're gonna see this all the time in plant groups and whatever. Humidity, humidity, it's always humidity. Humidity is the issue. And seriously, that is just like a fraction of the success of these plants growing inside of our homes. I think that humidity is like the easy, it's the easy answer, right? Like humidity fixes everything and that's really not true. The foundation for a very healthy plant growing in ambient is gonna always start with your root system. 
So before you even worry about what humidity is, if we're not, obviously if we're not talking about like a cloud forest kind of plant, um, but something like the tordum, make sure that it has like a nice, healthy, robust root system with brand new roots before you try and do anything like move it from a prop bin out into your living room. Take care of those roots and make sure that, you know, you're using something like a mycorrhizal inoculant to uh, give the plant the best chance possible at life outside of a controlled environment. Also, don't repot it too much. If it gets root bound, just leave it. Leave it until you start seeing that like the plant either isn't growing anymore at all, roots are growing up out of the soil, or like your leaves are rapidly yellowing for no reason that you can see. Like it's not rotting, there's no pests or whatever, you know you didn't like over fertilize or something. Um, just leave it alone. Allow it to get a little bit root bound. I feel like this is one of those philodendron that really enjoy being a little bit root bound and actually grow quite vigorously when they're root bound. Don't, you know, mess with it too much. Also try to not move it around too much. It's not like finicky, like a, you know, a fiddly fig. If you move it like three centimeters to the left, it just dies completely. But it's like, once you find a good spot for the tortum, you have an area where it can like spread its wings, just leave it. Try to not like move it too much, especially because the leaves like they actually will move quite fast finding the the light and you can get nice growth all in one direction but if you're constantly moving it around your plant is going to look crazy and it's not going to know where to face its leaves my billy is such a good example of that and maybe i can <laughs> maybe i can show it to you or i'll like insert a clip of it right now but this plant just it's never really had a solid home and because I keep moving it around, the leaves don't know where to go. And they're just kind of everywhere right now. There's some petioles that are like way longer than others because I moved it into an area that didn't have a lot of light. So it was like reaching for more light. And yeah, it just looks wild. So I, I feel like, you know, if you keep your philodendron in the same location and it knows what to expect, where the light's coming from, it's gonna have more of a ruly and maintainable growth pattern and one that won't stress you out too much okay i want to go a little bit higher with the soil but <sighs> i'm like i need this soil for other repots this week but this pot is massive okay so with this transition now that i've gone into a pot that's much bigger I'm gonna make sure to scale back my watering a bit because this plant is used to however much, um, why is it so dark? This plant is used to getting however much water would be in that old vessel. And I don't wanna shock it too much by having all of this excess water in parts of the vessel where there are no roots to uptake that water. And again, it just all goes back to balance, right? You're gonna, you're gonna water based on how big your root system is, how big your pot is, what the lighting situation is. And since I am still putting it out in the living room and I'm not changing the lighting situation, I wanna make sure that I'm not gonna drown this plant completely. I am going to be inoculating it today. I'm just gonna use some great white. That's kind of been my go-to. I have also been using billions just depends what mood I'm in. But I want to make sure to inoculate it. I always make sure to inoculate my plants after every repot. I want to secure this though. So you can see I've got these two clear poles here and I want to straighten out the, the um, I want to straighten out the stem, but I think I'm gonna have to move this a lot closer I haven't used this on camera for a while, but my Hugo's Amazing Tape, it's this tape that sticks to itself and it's clear and you can reuse it. Although I will say that the integrity of this tape severely diminishes once you remove it and once you um, wash it. So the reusability has not been amazing, but I think it's good for what it is. I'm just gonna tie these 
together because it's kind of falling apart or not falling apart. They're coming apart and it's like not as strong, so. I hope you guys got some use out of this video. If you've been struggling with the Tordom or if you've been wanting one and are a little bit intimidated, I think a lot of people haven't followed me because I have been so annoying in pushing the Tordom. There was one person who was like, I love your content, but if you recommend the Tordom one more time, I'm gonna unfollow you. <laughs> I, but I just love, I love the Tordom so much and it brings me so much happiness and I just want people to experience that because it's amazing. But I get it. This plant isn't for everyone. You know, we all have different taste, but I do think that there are some diehard Tordom lovers out there. And it makes me sad to think that some of you who want the Tordom or who have had it and like they it died and you're scared to get another one. Don't be scared all gonna be okay. This pole is way more sturdy now. I'm gonna actually use Hugo's tape to secure it to this pole because the Velcro tape is a go. I'll link this um, tape in the description, but I think there are some cheaper knockoffs if you don't wanna get like the na name brand stuff. You know what, I'm probably gonna need one of these anyway. I feel like it's gonna just come apart, so whatever. It's high up anyway, you can't really see it. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy it's done. Okay, let me just go um, and get some mica water and then we will water and wrap this baby up. I don't have an exact amount in terms of how much mica I use for every watering. I honestly, what I do is what Alice recommended. So I just take a little bit on a thing like this. I add it and I mix it. And she said she feels like she's added enough if you can actually smell the myco in the water. I can't smell it now, so I'm gonna add a bit more. And great white goes so far. So I, I don't really have a preference of like TPS to um, great white, but I feel like great white goes further with your money. So if you, or looking for something that's gonna last a lot longer, I would go with Great White. If you want something that smells like candy, go with Billions. And now it smells like mushrooms. So that is how I know I've added enough. And I don't really feel like you can over myco. Maybe you can in no drainage, but I don't, I don't think I've ever like noticed any negative effect that came with like over microing. <laughs> what do I know? I'm just a girl. I am so, so happy. She's got new pants. She can live in these pants for probably another like two years. I'm not even kidding. I, unless something goes horribly wrong or like it gets root rot or something, I'm gonna leave it in here probably until 2026. If I can, 2027 would be even better. Another good thing about using a pole, if you are gonna use a pole, is that you have to repot even less because your pole becomes an extension of the pot. Um, so that, I guess, is one reason why I would probably recommend a pole. Because like I said, I feel like this plant does best when it's left alone. Oh no, I'm itchy. I get itchy sometimes when the sap of philodendron touch me. Um, yeah, it's a way that you can ensure to keep extending that root system without having to actually touch the pot. Anyway, she's done and hopefully she likes her new life. Actually, not new life. Hopefully she likes life in her new pants. It's much, much bigger, so she'll have a lot more room to grow. Um, I'm glad that I finally sorted out this like weird crawling, climbing situation because it was tipping over because it was getting so top heavy. So I think this is the perfect vessel because now the the leaves can actually like sit on the pot. And even though I removed so many leaves, I think it looks great. I think she looks refreshed, like she just got a fresh haircut. And I'm happy, I'm very, very happy. Okay, anyway y'all, thank you for hanging out with me again. Thank you for watching another care video. I don't know if I'm going to be doing another one of these anytime soon, only because 
there's not really any other plant in my collection that I can think of right now that I would feel confident in giving you guys any solid care advice. So yeah, I hope this helps. If it does help you, please let me know. Um, send me pictures of your tortums because I feel like the tortum um, love out there is not enough. But we are out there and there are a good amount of us that love tortum. So anyway, um, don't forget to give don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and I will see you in the next one.